Uh, greetings, respected viewers. I am George from Ireland. Here I am in Sheen, uh, in London, and I'm, I'm in front of Cedar Court. This is the building where Richard Dimbleby lived um, in the late 1930s. So Richard Dimbleby was one of the United Kingdom's most prominent broadcasters, um, and uh, he commentated on things happening during the Second World War, or also uh, he was responsible for some war reportage at the time. And uh, really, in the late 40s into the early 50s, he was the voice of Britain. Um, he spoke um, in uh, received pronunciation. However, he didn't have that um, very antiquated cut glass accent. Was a bit more demotic, a bit more accessible to, to the average person. So he grew up in, in this part of London and um, he joined the BBC um, in uh, the early 1930s when the organization was, was still more or less in its infancy. It only having been founded by Lord Reith in 1922. Because of course, uh, Marconi had only um, uh, first uh, patented the radio in 1895, here in London actually. The guy is half Irish, half Italian. I know Ruskies will often tell you it was Popov invented the radio. It's debatable. I'm quite willing to believe it's Popov, but it is generally considered to have been Guillermo Marconi. Anyway, um, so uh, perhaps his most renowned broadcast was June 1953, um, when he commentated on uh, the coronation of uh, Her Majesty the Queen at uh, Westminster Abbey. And there's been a spirited debate um, in uh, establishment circles. Should this be broadcast or not? Should they film it at all? Actually, George VI coronation was also filmed in 1936, but that was um, far less widely known, but you can watch it. Um, George VI, who was terribly tongue-tied, um, who was um, painfully timid, who hated the limelight and loathed speaking in public. Um, but by 1953, things had changed, partly because a lot of people had got televisions, all right? 1936, John Logie Baird had the first ever television broadcast from one room to another here in London. Um, 1936, BBC television launched, but televisions were prohibitively expensive. By 1953, they were becoming affordable for the middle class, and the coronation is what prompted a lot of people to splash out on a television. Obviously, it soon put paid to cinemas. So um, he, he read up very extensively. He was well prepared for this. And they thought, should they broadcast it live or perhaps not? Should they just film it and then edit out any of the mistakes? But in the end, it was decided that they would broadcast it live. Some people were against it. Um, Churchill and, and the Queen herself believed that it ought to be broadcast live to get the public involved. So it was rehearsed several times, several full run-throughs. That's why these British official ceremonies run so smoothly, just because they've done them so many times, obviously over the centuries, but also before each one, they will do a couple of full run-throughs so everybody knows their role. And um, I don't think there were any mishaps, but obviously it was very tricky. So-and-so has to be walking backwards as someone is advancing and another person's coming from the side, trying to coordinate it all the time. They didn't have sort of the same stage management as you would these days with people on walkie-talkies. But anyway, it all panned out beautifully, as we know. The only bit that wasn't actually shown was when she was anointed with, um, with oil, which thought to be, to be sacred. There were people watching it, but the, film, the cameras didn't film that bit. So that is um, uh, Richard Dimbleby. Um, he had two sons, um, uh, Jonathan Dimbleby and David Dimbleby. I think I got them in the right order. And they're only about three years apart in age. But, um, and they're both very prominent BBC broadcasters. Um, one of them hosts Question Time. I always forget one of them. I met the younger one. The younger one, I think Jonathan is the younger one. And I remember when he spoke at the Oxford Union, he said, someone said, oh, that other Dimbleby, is he your father or is he your uncle? He thought it was hilarious. He's my brother, only three years older. They both went to, 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 to Charterhouse School. And then uh, the other one went to Christchurch, Oxford, which Oxford University is the grandest college of all, the most upper class one. Not so much anymore, it doesn't really matter, social status, but it did in the 60s when he was there. Member of the Bullingdon Club, no less, as in Boris Johnson and David Cameron were later in it for um, uh, upper class carousing and spitting champagne on oiks whilst threatening to bash them. Um, and the other, his younger son who went to, I think it was Sirencess, the Royal Agricultural College, before going into broadcasting. An odd move as he trained as a farmer. So that's Richard Dimbleby, um, who unfortunately died of, of, of throat cancer, brought on by smoking. Of course, uh, in his youth, they had absolutely no idea that smoking was um, carcinogenic. It was only in 1950 when uh, Dr. Richard Doll published his article in the British Medical Journal proving the link between tobacco consumption and uh, pulmonary cancer. That's enough about Richard Dimbleby.